Welcome to the Commerce Lab, where every week we sit down with top performing consumer brands and leaders to understand what drives their success. How did they hit their first million, the first 20 million, the first 100 million? What strategies are working for them today that you should be testing and what's not working that you should be avoiding? This isn't just a podcast. It's the business school for brand operators. Hey crew, welcome back to another episode of the Commerce Lab. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of pulling on a CEO or a founder of a brand, we're actually gonna be talking to somebody who is tasked with the day-to-day operations, working within the team, and scaling an eight-figure consumer-facing brand. And that guy is named Will Critcher. And Will Critcher is in charge of direct marketing for a brand called Death Wish Coffee. And you've heard of Death Wish, then you understand what they stand for. They're, they tout themselves as the strongest coffee in the world, an incredibly strong branding play. And today what we're doing is we're gonna talk to Will, who frankly is in charge of an incredible amount for the brand email, everything from email to Amazon to performance marketing spend. And we're going to sit down and talk about how he thinks about things like allocation of budget, right? When you have a certain amount of money that can be put towards all of these different efforts, where do you put money? Where do you put money when it comes to content creation and building up brand equity versus just allocating money into things like performance ad spend? Right. So we talk about how Will thinks about that and how Deathwish thinks about that. We also talk about in their market specifically, which is an incredibly competitive space, coffee is the number two most consumed non alcoholic beverage in the world just after water. Talk about a really, really competitive marketplace. They have to think very strategically about how they communicate to their customer because, frankly, anybody who drinks coffee is their customer. Anywhere from a baby boomer all the way down to a Gen X, Gen Y, millennial, et cetera. All these folks need to be need to be communicated with in a different voice and with a different set of purposes. And so Will actually breaks down the framework that they use and how he thinks about communicating to different generations when it comes to their product. And it's something that everybody listening can take away and apply to how you speak to your specific audience, whether you have a very specific target or whether or not you actually span different generations just like Deathwish does. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And it's something we're going to continue to do a lot more of at the Commerce Lab is finding these brand operators that are working within brands that have an incredible amount of on the ground knowledge and extracting that knowledge so you can go out and apply it to your business. So without further ado, Will Critcher of Deathwish Coffee. Hey, Will, welcome to the show. Yeah, right, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. It's uh, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. It's going to be a little bit different than what we've done uh, previously. So when we before we get actually into the nitty gritty, uh, maybe just take 30 seconds and give everybody just a really quick intro of who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, my name is Will Critcher. Uh, I am I handle the direct marketing here at Deathwish Coffee Company. Uh, we are a you know we're the world's strongest coffee, so our coffee is distributed all over the country. Obviously on e-com as well. Uh, we've got a pretty big um, wholesale and retail uh, extension to the company um, that we've made a lot of a lot of progression on over the past couple of years. Um, predominantly though, I, I handle a lot of the e-com uh, advertising and marketing side of things though. Awesome. So you said you you kind of mentioned your titles, direct marketing, maybe mm-hmm. give me a little more information. Kind of what does that mean? What is that? What like uh, of the direct marketing umbrella, what falls underneath that for your responsibilities? It's, it's a big umbrella. I can tell you that yeah, much. I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I guess long story short, I was brought into Death Wish, um, the, uh, brought into the Death Wish team for a multitude of reasons. Uh, I think that the primary one was just being so that we could take a lot of our ad management that we outsource and bring it all in-house for continuity um, and just obviously cost reasons and things of that nature. Um, so from from the bottom up, I pretty much manage all of our paid outbound efforts. So that's social search um, and Amazon as well. Uh, Amazon okay. is probably a, a pretty big chunk of my dime, uh, I would say though. Um, but then I also handle uh, audience segmentation, email cadence and strategy, um, and just, I, I really help, uh, I work with some pretty incredible people. I think I'm, I'm super fortunate to, uh, I don't think there's a lot of people in, in the marketing world that can say, yeah, I work for, you know, on the brand side, uh, that have an incredibly talented designer and incredibly talented content writer and incredibly talented social media manager. Um, you know, and, and the people I work with are, are just so impressive. So it makes what I do 
even better, um, but also allows, I think I kind of, I approach things more analytically than creative and most so because I lack a little bit of that creative uh, gumption. Um, but so I can help, uh, you know, work with some of our design ideas or content strategies and, and just kind of put more of a, uh, you know, the, the cogs and, and transmissions and, and kind of p- help them piece together the engine so we can um, produce, you know, some pretty cool stuff. That's, that's awesome. That is a, that's a large umbrella. So do you guys, is, is all of this in house? Do you guys do everything from paid social, Amazon, email marketing, uh, everything is done in house? Uh, so the majority, um, so okay. social, we, we do a lot of the ad creation, um, and ideation here. Uh, we come up with the audience, uh, ideas, you know, in house. However, when it just comes from, you know, a throughput side of things, because we, we run so many, especially on social uh, side of things, we do outsource that, uh, to a vendor that helps us, you know, essentially, you know, when, if we have an ad change for one ad, it, it you know, could apply to, you know, 50 different right. ad sets. Sure. So, you know, we definitely use, um, help in that. And the, the, the company that actually that we use for, uh, to, to make any of our ad copy changes on social also, um, helps manage our PPC side on search. Um, essentially we, you know, we work with them and give them instruction on these are the terms that we want to pursue. Um, and then they create the ads, um, for us and then just give us back that reporting. So that's the only thing that we don't fully have control over. Uh, I would say like the full implementation of PPC and social. Um, but when it comes to the strategy and, um, you know, an, an ideation of things, we, we definitely take ownership in that. Okay. Very cool. So let's, I'll kind of, kind of dive into some questions here and, and start digging into things that I'm, I'm really curious about, but to give everybody just a little bit of context, what we're going to be doing on this episode is one of the things we want to start doing at the Commerce Lab is having conversations with the, the guys that are what I'm calling in the trenches. So these are the folks that are tasked with actual, you know, the actual day-to-day operations of scaling a consumer facing brand. So we've talked in the past with CEOs. In fact, we actually had uh, an interview that we did with, um, with Mike, who is the, the founder. Uh, and actually, is he still the CEO at Deathwish? He absolutely yeah. is. Awesome. Yeah. So we had, we had an interview with, with Mike, you know, probably a few years ago talking about how he started the brand and the whole story behind it. But one of the most things I'm, I'm curious and interested in now is talking to folks that are in the trenches, doing the day-to-day work and figuring out how do they think about scaling now? Because things have changed dramatically over the last three years, especially in the world of performance marketing, right? And how you allocate ad spend and how you allocate budget to scaling up a brand. So what I wanted to do is bring Will on and have a conversation with him to talk about exactly what they're doing and how he thinks about modern day sort of scaling in 2019. So, well, I'll kind of go through some questions and then we'll, we'll kind of riff on, on some of these and, and probably go off on a few tangents. But probably what I'm most interested in understanding uh, at the high level is sort of a death wish in the way that you think about direct marketing. How do you think about sort of allocation of where you guys put resources? So do you guys do, do you guys have like a roadmap for saying, okay, we're going to allocate 25% of our budget to kind of social spend, you know, 30% of our budget to this. How do you guys think about how to allocate your marketing budget towards scaling? Uh, well, so I mean, a little bit of context here. So, you know, Deathwish has, I, I believe we have 35 employees. And so, you know, being, being a high eight figure annual company. Um, you know, that's, there's a lot of responsibility under, you know, a a smaller staff. So the marketing team specifically just has six people. So when it comes to establishing a budget and how we're going to allocate that, I think we've, we've currently what we, you know, we plan based off of what, what has worked, but we're also, um, you know, being proactive in, in what we think is going to be working in the future. So outside of using, you know, the usual suspects of, you know, social media, for instance, specifically social, um, you know, I personally think it's it's really critical for us to um, you know for our brand to understand what leverage we have in our specific space because you know at the end of the day social CPMs are pretty much as uh, are going to be as ephemeral as the results that they achieve you know without mm-hmm. any sort of competitive analysis and strategy so I think prior to us like deciding what type, you know where we're going to allocate money based or you know on top of us deciding where to allocate money to based upon historical proof of what's worked and what hasn't worked. We also look at, you know, what our, you know, what our competitors are doing and, and where, you know, where we plan on going in the future. And then we try to, you know, be as, you know, make, uh, take, uh, what's it, what's the word I'm looking for? I would say like, you know, uh, mitigated risks, you know, we want to, we want to, you know, move forward and be proactive. You know, we don't want to be defensive. Um, but at the same time, you know, we also don't want to, you know, say yes to everything, which I think sometimes we, we, we like to do here. Um, but, the calculated risk seemed to help. There we go. Not mitigated, calculated. That was what we're looking for. 
Um, it's sort of a know, healthy, healthy mix of kind of doubling down on what works, but also allocating budget to try kind of new things that that potentially the competition hasn't tried yet. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, uh, for instance, we um, you touched on this earlier in the sense of the email marketing. So we do all email marketing in house. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, one of the things that we look at is, you know, we try to focus on, so obviously beyond what we just pay for our ESP as a whole, you know, we really try to, uh, one of, one of the main job the tasks that I was presented with when I first joined Deathwish was, you know, looking at what we were u- doing in our email and, and finding a way to optimize it to not only just increase revenue, um, you know, because if, if that's the metric that we're gauging what's successful or what's not successful in email is revenue, then how can we increase that? But then, you know, using what we also see companies that are not in our space, what, what are they doing um, that uh, is either driving revenue or using email marketing specifically to generate, um, to generate, you know, brand loyalty, for instance. Um, and so, right. fo- yeah, so we focus uh, a lot on that. We actually just recently um, essentially separated. We usually send out a, a weekly Thursday email and that e- email uh, consistently for a couple of years would include whatever product or deal uh, we were coming out with on that Thursday. And then beneath that would be our, our high performing content that from any of the, the blogs that we had written. And then beneath that, we also have a podcast. Um, so we would post that show. And so um, I looked in, into, you know, pretty much just like looking like, you know, who's winning on share voice, where's the click share going. And that seemed to be the metric that was the determining factor of what was impacting revenue. And so essentially we just, we split that and created a newsletter um, a, a weekly newsletter that goes out every Monday called the scoop and the scoop. We, we literally don't <laughs> sell anything. We actually yeah. direct it. We we've directed traffic to uh, some of our customers. Like we, we have some of the best fans, honestly, and customers in the world. Like they we've had this one guy, he made a, a chair. It was a, it was a skull chair. And um, we just put him at the top of this email. And I think it, it, it took like, I want to say like 1900 clicks to his, his page. And we actually got a response back like, man, you're, you're overloading me right now with, you know, <laughs> with people coming over to me. Um, but, you know, we, we just try to take into consideration, you know, again, like if, if uh, not just our audience, but audiences as a whole, you know, like they, they're interested in, you know, in news, politics, music, stories, you know, current events, friends and family, but brands, you know, when, especially on the email side, and this I think translates to social uh, you know, what brands want to talk about our, our products and services and our brand. And so, you know, there's, there's a, a bit of friction there. So, you know, what we try to do is, you know, like give that, you know, speak to them about the things that they actually give a shit about and, you know, talk about things that are also in line with brand. But then from that point, you know, it, it generates brand loyalty because people then will think, you know, we increase our open rate because they know that they're not going to be sold anything right. on Mondays, you know, but then on yep. Thursday, you know, it, now it has all this, uh, extra real estate that we can help, you know, really become creative in how we display our, um, you know, whatever that product or deal might be, which is, I mean, d- d- we've actually, since we've made the split, we've seen a 40% increase in revenue per email on Thursdays. Um, and our open rate for our newsletter, which is over, uh, actually, we just sent out Monday, I think it just uh, passed 100,000 subscribers has a 32% open rate. Um, That's awesome. That, and that email again has no traffic to like you couldn't click anything in that email that would take you to a product page or a page truly selling you anything, and they generate a substantial amount of revenue just just by through content. That's awesome. So and so you guys right now in terms of email, and, and this is aside from any you know automations or anything you guys might be sending, mm-hmm. but for manual campaigns, you send two emails a week, and that is your that's that that's your full you know strategy. Yeah, that's, I would say that's probably about like our, like our minimum. I mean, we do, you know, yep. we, we filter in uh, reminder emails and again, excluding any automations, you know, we, we do filter in reminders and certain weeks, obviously, you know, with, depending upon what the, the calendar looks like, you know, we, we might send three, but you know, we, we've run a couple of, you know, surveys, you know, through our most engaged and least engaged audience. And if, we seem to have found that sweet spot of the two days. And I mean, the benefit too, is that if they know that they're not going to be pitched on Monday, then they're going to be much more open to getting two extra seat. You know, if we decide right. to, to jump up to three emails a week, then they know that, you know, like they're going to yep. be way more open to it. So it, uh, yep. it affords us the opportunity to send more. Yeah. And the reason why I was asking, well, I was also just curious how you guys came to that number two. And then also because if that is the number, then, you know, literally 50% of what you're sending customers through your manual campaigns is just pure content. Right. So it's a you know, yep, 50, exactly 50, right. right. 50, 50 balance of just pure content. And then, you know, sales, promotions, product focus related content, which is, it's funny. Cause that's actually the exact 
type of um, type of allocation that we recommend to our clients over at Blue Stout. Um, and we can talk more that more about that later. But on the email side, you know, this is the, the term that we always talk about is this term called brand equity, right? And what mm-hmm. that content does is it builds brand equity and you can then cash in that equity when you actually need to sell product through your, through your other emails. Um, you guys are in such crowded space, right? I mean, the coffee space is, I mean, unbelievably crowded, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like, you know, one of the ways you guys have been able to kind of rise above and, and really compete is with this idea of just pure branding, right? And storytelling around the brand. Mm-hmm. I remember Mike saying in the first podcast that we did with him that you guys have had customers in the past that literally have tattooed, right? Like the Death Wish logo on themselves. Like that's yeah. the type of sort of equity and strength that's in the brand. So mm-hmm. I'd be curious, so like, how do you guys think about building brand equity. You know, if you, when we kind of talked about allocation of marketing spend and we'll talk more, more about performance marketing here in a second, but I think the, you know, performance marketing works better if you have already built a massive, really solid brand, right? So mm-hmm. how do you guys think about, you know, investing in brand building? Like other than just, you know, you know, you mentioned one piece, which is this weekly newsletter of content, the scoop beyond that, what else are you guys doing to build, build that brand equity? So, uh you know, it's kind of, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because you look at, um, look at other competitors in our space, like for instance, you know, Folgers, like the, the easiest, like the most notable name, right. you know, I think like kind of in that, uh, in that consumer package, good, uh, competitor of ours in our space. And, you know, so I think like a good example of, of how we have brand equity versus, versus Folgers is that you don't see anybody walking around wearing a Folgers t-shirt. Right. That, you know, you don't right. see anybody with a Folgers <laughs> tattoo. And so I right. think that, that, that speaks to what you're saying in the sense that we, you know, that we value the brand equity. And I think that, you know, and how we, we, we reinforce that and we try to continue to grow that and by penetrating markets that we don't have, you know, a share of voice in, for instance, um, you know, we, we look at, you know, and again, I feel like this is such a cliche for people to kind of, you know, break down each of the, the generations into their groups. But I think it's, it's really important because at least it gives you a starting point, you know, or at least gives us an idea of how to, how to talk to people. And so, I mean, when you said that coffee, for instance, is a, you know, it's a super competitive space, you know, I, like, obviously, yes, I would agree with you. And I think that, you know, if you knew that, you know, for instance, coffee is the second most consumed um, non-alcoholic beverage on earth behind water. So, I think knowing that fact isn't a prerequisite for having to like having the understanding that the space that we operate in the coffee space is, is incredibly competitive. But when you understand how competitive the coffee space is, and then you also consider that fact when you, when you work it backwards, I think it gives you an idea as to like how competitive the space is. And so how we look at, you know, understanding that if it's the second most consumed beverage on earth or second most not the or there we go, the, Second most non second most consumed non alcoholic beverage. There we go. <laughs> uh, consumed <laughs> beverage on earth. Um, you know, then then that that certainly speaks to um, you know a vast majority of people from all ages that that drink coffee. So if we're looking at how we can create equity with each of these you know people across the different you know socioeconomic state uh, positions in life and ages and and everything, we we try to obviously categorize them through generational aspect. And so. Um, one of the things that, that I take into consideration when, you know, that I actually, I take like, I find very compelling. And I think it's something that, you know, I definitely kind of, I'm very preachy here about this, um, is, uh, looking at, um, each generation as, uh, you know, what is their, their consumption. So mm-hmm. for instance, with boomers, uh, they're, they're, um, and there was a study done by, um, I think it was McKinsey and Bucks, 1824, um, uh, that, that was published somewhat recently. Um, and, and they talk about this specifically, but, um, boomers uh, are best represented by, you know, consumption, um, as an ex- as an expression of ideology. And so if we understand that, okay, boomers are, you know, their main consumption is an expression of ideology, then they are the people that I think that our brand specifically can align to in the sense of, you know, speaking, you know, strong coffee statements and I statements and kind of resonating with them, but how can we keep our brand aligned uh, how can we stay in, in line with our brand when we, you know, come to the, the generation of Gen X? And so Gen X is actually, um, cons- they're uh, best represented by the consumption of status. And so then that's why, you know, we, we really leverage the fact that we are the world's strongest coffee with them, you know, and, and kind of, you know, make sure that, you know, that's not, the messaging is in line with them. And it's also, or I'm sorry, the messaging is in line with, with that statement, our brand, but it's also providing, you know, that, 
that sense of status that you're drinking the world's strongest coffee. And then with millennials, they want, you know, the consumption of experience. And so that's where we dive into um, some segments that uh, Thomas, our art director, came up with a couple of years ago. And we shot it all here ourselves, or we all shot it in-house too, is uh, called our Grind It Out series. And just talking about, you know, the the work ethic and, and, and you know, the, the series itself, you know, certainly had people across all different generations, but it was very, um, you know, pointed to the point uh, or pointed to uh, speaking towards, you know, what fuels you and, and, you know, how, how Death Wish can essentially, you know, fuel your experiences in life or your passions in life. And then you've got the, you know, Gen Z. And I think Gen Z is, is the one I get super excited about because essentially, you know, the boomers are going to, unfortunately, they're going to pass away and Gen X is going to be a little older, millennials be a little older. And so as Gen Z steps up, so I think Gen Z's consumption is more of a consumption of access. So think of companies that are doing really well, um, especially in, um, I was going to say Airbnb, but I don't think they super apply to Gen Z just yet. But we think of like Uber and um, right. Grubhub and things like that, you know, so I think, you know, what can we do to help, um, you know, create equity in the sense of making our brand not only accessible to them, but then you know, finding ways to create equity in platforms that they're familiar with and that they operate in. So, you know, obviously gaming is a big one. Millennials are certainly the, I think, the first gaming generation. Gen Z is, you know, it's 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 actually cool to be, you know, like it's, it's, tra- it's very trendy. At least in my experience and what we've seen across, it's not, you know, like if somebody played video games when they were, you know, going to high school in 2005, they might have been looked at as kind of like a loser, for instance. And I'm air quoting a right. loser. Even though right. Nothing wrong with <laughs> the, general, to the general view of things. But, right. you know, Gen Z, it's totally different. You know, it's a, it's, it's a totally, you know, like every, like you could be, you know, the, the quarterback for varsity football team, but you could also be playing Fortnite as soon as you get home every day. And, and there's no, there's no distinction of difference of human being. And I think Gen Z is, does a much better job, I think, than any generation so far of, of uh, being, I think, accepting to that, you know, I think and being okay with that. And so we're trying to, you know, enter that, that space, but do it in an authentic way, you know, not just, you know, we're not just looking to put our brand in front of, you know, a Twitch streamer because we're there. I mean, it, sure, that makes sense. But at the same time, like Gen Z is very, you know, like, they're no dummies, you know what I mean? It's like, we think, you know, we millennials, you know, we're, we're, every decision or question that we answer is immediately looked at on a phone, you know? And so it's like, you know, we, we learned that habit where Gen Z, you know, was born into that. So they're, they're going to, they're going to call you out on your bullshit right away. And so I think, you know, focusing on the truth aspect of those, that stuff, you know, it's another reason why we were super committed to fair trade, you know, but it obviously provides great opportunities for the farmers and fair living wages for them. So I think, you know, that helps create a little bit of equity with that brand in the sense that, or I'm sorry, with that generation, um, you know, to, to be an honest business, you know, to be as transparent as we possibly can. Um, but also, you know, respecting what we, what we want to accomplish at the same time and not, not deviating too much. It's a super long winded answer, but I think that's probably the best way. It was amazing. I think that was super insightful. It's very insightful. And I've got, I've got a few follow-up questions. I want to dig in on it because I think it's, I, I think it's, it's very unique. The fact that you guys adjust messaging to that broad span of individuals, right? So it's Mm -hmm. not this idea that you guys have one core message that, that you use throughout all your, you know, through all your channels to keep that congruency of message, but you've got sort of a singular message, but then you adapt it to the audience that you can tap into each generation and what they hold and and think of as as important. Right. So first off, that's a ton of work in in, in terms of maintaining that level of brand, you know, equity and building up that type of content for each one of those generations. Um, So I'd love to talk a little more about kind of how you guys execute that and some sort of examples of how you do it. Um, But I guess the sort of the first question was, you know, when did you guys start thinking about this in terms of generations and speaking to each generation, you know, in a way that's going to resonate with them best? Is it is this a new concept or has this been around since you know well before you were there? Uh, I, I can certainly say that the the understanding of of messaging and the audience has certainly been a known thing, you know, throughout throughout like the inception of, of Death Wish. I can't say that you know this is a brand new concept or so it's a unique philosophy more or less. I think I guess mm-hmm. I said in the beginning, like I, I'm very preachy with this. And so it's something that I, I definitely have tried to, you know, bring forward, especially on the paid ads side of things, you know, again, stepping away from just, you know, the, the content side of things like, you know, understanding, 
um, who's that guy? His name is, I think is Larry Kim. Uh, he did, uh, he, he gave this example one time where you take these two uncorrelated topics essentially. And then as you create the two circles, like what's in the middle and that mm-hmm. middle is your target audience It's very refined and it's very specific messaging. And so that was the first thing I started to bring in and say, okay, if we have this product over here, like let's say for instance, we just came out with leggings. And so what we do is we take leggings and then also, you know, there's not a, a a tight correlation, but there's some of a correlation of coffee. And then you also add in the third parameter of, um, you know, NCAA or division one sports and things of that nature. And then you deliver an ad of a, of a female actually. So what we did is we had a, we did, we did a shoot with a, a D one softball player and she was holding a can of our cold brew. And so then we have very specific messaging, you know, targeted at that very specific audience. Um, I think actually we targeted, uh, UCLA and that was right around the time when the, um, uh, D one softball championships were up. And so it, it performed really well. So, you know, you know, being a little tactful in that aspect of things, um, I think is, is a new, um, it's, it's a new implementation of things. And that's, I think, um, uh, not to toot my own horn, but I think that's one of the reasons why I was brought in is to kind of, again, like if all of these, you know, pieces and, and ideas make sense from all of the people that are, that are contributing to this. I think it's just getting like, just needed somebody to kind of help tie some of them together. Um, you know, but so, you know, I would say that speaking generationally, um, it's, it's certainly, um, I would say like in the sense of how we're trying to be more aggressive and more specific to it. Um, it's a newer thing and we haven't fully obviously perfected it. I mean, we're, sure. we're, we're far from ever going to being able to accomplish that, but I mean, you know, we, we, we certainly strive to. And so again, I have tons of questions here, but then, so if you tie this back to kind of how you think about sort of day-to-day execution on performance marketing, mm-hmm. you know, the example you just gave now, is, is that something you guys sort of consider a test? Do you throw that type of content out to a cold audience? Is that something you use in retargeting ads to your existing audience to come back and buy again? How do you think about how you take that type of content and then distribute it out into the marketplace? And who do you put that in front of? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, so so that that example I gave you um, actually was tested on a complete cold audience. We that that wasn't used for retargeting. We used the image uh, because of again our our uh, the the amount of latitude that we have just in the sense of the day to day for the hours. You know, we ended up using that image throughout our messaging, but we also used it. it we created it specifically to target an audience that we just don't really have. And so gotcha. we did test that as the cold image. Um, I think, you know, if, as we get a little bigger and as we get more, you know, more people, you know, in at Death Wish and we have, you know, the ability to kind of get out there and do all of the types of shots that we want to take or, you know, take all the photos we want to take. Because again, Thomas, our art director is the graphic designer. He's the merchandiser. He's the videographer. He's the cinematographer. You know what I mean? It's like, he does, he does, <laughs> like I, I, I get, I sit here and like, I look at my day-to-day list and I'm just like, man, I've got like seven days worth of Amazon ad campaigns I've got to, you know, figure out. And he's like, man, I don't even want to hear about it. You know, it's just like, you know, right. it's like, there's, there's just no room for it. So, um, you know, but yeah, so uh, to get back to it, it's just, we, uh, you know, we, we take these ideas, these concepts and we, we, you know, certain products, obviously we know speak to a specific, um, either market or generation that we have no real messaging to. And we, we, we cold it, you know, we, we, we test it out through cold, but we also, you know, we're, we're not just kind of blindly throwing something on the wall. We definitely put a, you know, a fair amount of thought in, into, and especially on the creative side. Um, and so, you know, let's just try to we anything, especially on a merchandise side, but not so much coffee, but any merchandise, um, beyond the scope of our current audience and customer base, we definitely take what's the creative thing that we you know, like, what market can we penetrate with this specific product that we have no access to? And that is not, a uh, you know, who's not currently buying from us. And then we direct it to that specific, uh, segment of people. And then ideally, you know, just create some, some recognition in that audience and then try to grow from there. Hey crew, just a quick interruption to ask if you like what you are hearing and want more, perhaps even a weekly digest of what's working today in the world of e-commerce. Every week, our team of strategists compile a single email with growth strategies and operations tactics gleaned from our work with and analysis of today's top performing brands. Think of it as the brand operators cheat sheet to keep you ahead of the curve and ahead of the competition. Just head over to thecommercelab.com. That's the commercelab.com to sign up. So is the concept of death wish that technically everybody could be your customer, like in theory? I mean, is I mean, it, do you got, be our customer. <laughs> okay, okay, well then there you go. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's not like you guys say, Hey, look, we, we, you know, we have a, a lane that we play in and we don't, we don't, we don't drive outside of our lane. Right. The idea is that technically anybody could be a death wish, you know, coffee drinker. Really then it's your job and your team's job and, and the company's job to figure out how do you make 
your brand and your story relevant to each of these different segments of the marketplace, whether that be generational segments or whether it just be sort of interest-based segments. Um, but technically, you, you guys should fit into every market, every buyer. I, I I agree. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you, for instance, you know, we, we sell our coffee at Walmart, but we also sell it at uh, Sprouts, for instance, you know, so two, wow. you know, so again, like if our coffee is, you know, positioned next to something that is, let's say a higher volume of coffee, you know, where you can get 32 ounces of ground coffee from competitor X and then sitting right next to it is a 16 ounce bag of death wish coffee for, you know, eight, seven, eight dollars more Then you kind of have that cost diversion you know, or in people don't, you know, they, they become hesitant to it, but we have no problem selling our coffee there. And so, but we also obviously have no problem selling our coffee in, in Sprouts, for instance, either. So I think, you know, we, we knew that going into it, you know, we knew that we have, you know, we have customers throughout, you know, all phases of income and throughout all phases of interest and affinity, but you know, you, you are right that we, we do believe that we can market and speak to everybody, but we just want to do it, you know, tactfully, respectfully, but also in line with our brand. And we also understand too, that, you know, our, we do fight a little bit of an uphill battle with the fact that we are the world's strongest coffee and not everybody drinks coffee. And some people just like decaf, for instance. So we understand that we're not going to, you know, convert them, you know, we're not right. trying to convert them. You know, at right. the end of the day, if, if you drink coffee with caffeine in it, then there's, there's no reason why we don't believe that there's any reason why you shouldn't l- at least give our coffee a shot. Got it. Okay. That's, so that's fascinating. I, I, I didn't realize that's how you guys thought about the market. Cause I think that's in contrary to a lot um, that it's very different to how a lot of brands think. Um, but it makes total sense in terms of how you guys then operate and going out and sort of trying and testing these different sort of versions of cold kind of cold introductions to cold audiences um, and then filtering them into kind of into your story and then down the funnel. Um, just kind of poking around on the brand before we, we hopped on the podcast today. I noticed you guys are doing like a, like a fantasy football partnership. And I noticed that it was on ESPN. I don't know if it's a partnership with ESPN or what it may be, but is that another example of something that where you guys have sort of found this niche that you think you can penetrate and you need to find some overlap in messaging to, to get the brand out there to this, this new audience? So um, that's kind of funny about that up. So they're, we're actually doing our draft, I think tonight. And um, I'm, I haven't played fantasy in quite a few years, but it's, it's I can only speak to, I'm, I'm a little outside of the circle on this one, but I think I can, I'm, I'm being pretty accurate when I say this, like that's just us doing us, you know, like that's just because really? like we have a lot of football fans here, you know, and, and they just like a lot of people love playing fantasy. We do have some uh, relationships with some local um, radio stations at one of them. I believe we do have a connection with ESPN. So I think we're, we're definitely, you know, uh, you know, uh, working, you know, our relationship in that to obviously help get exposure. And it certainly does give us access to, um, to market. But I mean, we do have, we do have, um, uh, awareness in the football area specifically because of the Super Bowl commercial. Um, so we certainly like to, you know, remind people that we're still relevant in that area. But I think, you know, we're in the sense of, you know, there's, we can certainly capture more of, of, of those coffee drinkers uh, attention and, you know, there as then as customers, but at the same time, I think we're never going to peak the Super Bowl in at least in that market. So I think, you know, staying relevant is always ideal. But I mean, you know, the, the that's just the benefit from from the people here loving to play fantasy football more or less. You know, it's just us kind of doing us. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. I thought I thought that was more in line with sort of something you guys might be testing with a with a cold audience. No, um, yeah. Very cool. So Let's let's sort of kind of take a take a turn here. I want to talk a little more specifics uh, around the performance marketing side, because specifically with coffee and what's what's sort of the average price point for a bag of Death Wish? Twenty bucks. 20 I mean, bucks. It, it depends on where you get it. But yeah, it's like eighteen to twenty dollars, depending on on where you get it. But it, yeah, we we really reinforce the subscription on our site too, which I think brings it to about uh, I think it's like sixteen dollars. I think yeah, it's twenty percent off of the subscription. Got it. Okay. So, you know, on the, on the higher, you know, higher end of pricing for a bag of coffee. Right. Um, but at the same time, definitely very low price point when you're looking at having to drive sales through performance ad spend. Right. So Mm -hmm. you're looking at, you know, if somebody just comes in, buys one bag of coffee and they spend 20 bucks, you know, the cost per acquisition, you know, is probably getting pretty close if not exceeding that. So I'd be kind of curious to think about how you guys think about specifically you, how do you think about sort of balancing, you know, customer acquisition costs with a lower price point product? You know, we, we just see for a lot of brands we work with any sort of order, you know, average order value that below say $50 tends to get really, really pressured and squeezed when trying to do performance ad spend marketing. So just be curious how you guys think about and strategize for that, um, especially given rising ad costs on social platforms. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, 
and that's I feel like I could I could go on this one for quite a while here. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I I come back. So I uh, own actually I no longer own a, a marketing agency. I ran it for a few years, and and my primary focus when I started it was real estate marketing. Um, so I would help agents essentially sell their listings. I would fi- help them find buyers. So when I transitioned to the brand side on Deathwish, and I was I remember I think it was one of the first things I said. I think it was in, the, in my first interview that I had with Mike. And I was just like, I can't even tell you how excited I am to try to sell something that costs twenty dollars versus trying to sell something that costs four hundred thousand dollars. So it's like getting really excited about just that transactional aspect is just I think it'll be so much easier to an extent, but so much harder to maintain, you know, that that lower A cost and keeping the customer acquisition as low as possible. So, you know, we obviously we try to generate as much um, you know, effect that we can through our customer through our through our current um consumer base that we have, you know, so we obviously want to keep, you know, our subscriptions high to kind of help mitigate any sort of, you know, exploratory ads that we might have when it comes to social ads and kind of just blindly putting it out there. Um, but when it comes to our coffee specifically, you know, we um we do run a lot of retargeting ads and, and what we consider to be effective is, you know, we have a lot of legacy campaigns that are running and, and constantly keep, you know, our, our income, our, our throughput is, is acceptable for what it's worth. I think, you know, we try to use our, our merchandise as, you know, look, we know that like, if we can make, if we can make what we put into it, essentially like make it worth our while, but that's giving us access to a different market and then let that market funnel in to then keep, to drive down our, our coffee ad spend down essentially in the sense of, you know, if we can get them to, if we can break even on, you know, $500 worth of legging ads and then we can get $500 worth of purchases, but then we get, you know, 10 of those people turn into coffee, um, coffee subscription, um, holders or just coffee buyers, then that's just going to help keep driving that price down as we, you know, as the door kind of uh, revolves and, you know, new people come in and some people unfortunately leave. So I think we really try to use, you know, use the merchandise as a way to kind of help funnel it in as well as the content. Um, so we just try to maintain from my point of view, I always, just, my goal is, you know, obviously any sort of sales ads that, you know, we're essentially like any sort of converting ads that we have on, let's just say Facebook, for instance, the goal is to keep the, you know, the A cost as, as low as possible. Um, however, outside of that, and this is where I, I think, um, you know, I definitely, uh, I try to convince everybody and and not, I don't do it too well all the time, you know, but you know, it's just like looking at certain things like, Hey, yeah, we might have, you know, we might be making 15% or yeah, spending 15% to to sell this bag of coffee here, which is which is considerably good considering the volume that we sell it. However, let's, let's, let's totally be fine with having 70% ACOS over here on this thing that's, you know, getting us all these new people. And so then we try to kind of mitigate that. But again, that that's where the allocation of budget comes from though, even though we're, you know, selling merchandise, like for instance, again, the leggings, you know, I look at that as a, as a branding tool. Um, and so, you know, we we're, we're willing to kind of take that. Uh, I don't want to not, not going to say a loss, but like we're willing to take that, you know, flush trade on that. So that way we can just kind of keep people into, because we know once, once they, they get into our brand. Once they read our newsletter and they see who we are and they drink coffee and they try the coffee, we know that we're going to do a good job in, in maintaining them. Um, you know, we, so it's, I think that's, if, I, if that answers your question, I think it's kind of the best way I can keep it short form. Yeah, I think, well, I'll, d- I'll dig in a little bit. So, so the way that you think about it is that you're not necessarily okay taking a loss on the first purchase. Sure. Uh, yeah. Right. But you're okay taking a pretty low margin on the first purchase, knowing that once you get them into your ecosystem, that you guys have very, you know, you have strong retention, strong story, um, strong brand equity, and you feel confident that, that you're going to get enough of those people to, to continue to buy or, or opt in subscription that it's going to make it worth it, right? Yeah, that's that. It, I mean, yeah, you said it perfectly. <laughs> do you guys, and, and how do you guys sort of measure that performance? Is it, you know, is it as clean as really being able to value and, and understand? customer lifetime value and then determine, okay, we know that average customer lifetime value of folks that, that end up coming through, say Facebook is, is X. So we're okay with a customer acquisition cost of Y. Do you guys think of it as, as sort of nitty gritty as that? Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think that we would, we would certainly like to get to that point to where we can really, you know, kind of look at the customer acquisition cost and look at what, the return on the return on our ad spend and the lifetime value of a customer. And it, I guess I can, I know that that's not a very granular piece of information and a metric to look at, but I think with the amount of people that we have and the things that we're, that we constantly take on through the day, we have to look at it a little with a zoom out from that a little bit. And so what we try to focus on is, you know, looking at, so if we have, uh, 
you know, let's say, let's say we have 80% of our, of our daily purchases come from um, existing customers. So our goal then is to, is to drive that down a little bit. Like, you know, how can we take off, like shave off a percentage? And so we kind of look at that as a metric and saying, okay, you know, as long as, you know, as revenue is increasing, you know, we're, we're beating goals from the prior year and our, our returning customer is staying within the threshold that we want, but it is, you know, kind of dropping down to the point where, you know, we're bringing in new people, then, then I, I can, I can personally say that, that I believe that that's a very good thing, especially when you consider uh, consumer loyalty and things like that. But um, the metric that I, that, that we focus on is, you know, how can we increase, you know, new first time purchasers while also increasing revenue. And ideally, you know, as we grow and get, you know, more hands on deck and more talented people here, I think we'll be able to, um, you know, kind of zoom into those things and get, and get more um, granular with how we gauge uh, successful, you know, ad spend more or less like on that level specifically. Gotcha. Okay. That makes total sense. And sort of along those lines, you sort of mentioned, you know, looking at, you know, how do you get more people introduced to the brand uh, while, you know, driving revenue up, right? What do you see right now? So, sort of, you know, we're recording this in kind of early September, 2019. What do you see right now that's working as sort of new customer acquisition channels that maybe, you know, is, is different than what's worked in the past or, or things that, you know, obviously everybody knows Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, costs there have been going up. Is there anything that you've seen that's working better or working differently that wasn't working in the past or sort of new channels people should be exploring? Uh, but I mean, I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's kind of, it's kind of nice right now, like sitting in the sense where like the, the landscape is, is kind of simmered out just for a minute. Social media is kind of, you know, kind of hitting that plateau to a degree. I mean, uh, I, I definitely, you know, we were just talking recently, like I think exploring TikTok would be something, you know, uh, definitely worthwhile. Um, I think, hmm. you know, when you look at, uh, I, when you look at what, you know, how, and again, I'm, I'm 30. So it's, you know, I, like I grew up in Facebook, I grew up in MySpace even. So, you know, I was one of those kids using it. And so I, you know, I didn't hear a lot of the noise that was going on from people that were older than me, you know, until now that I'm older and I look at TikTok and I'm like, like, oh, it's a bunch of kids on there. But it's like, yeah, I mean, like you were one of those kids on Facebook. And I think TikTok is, is definitely gonna, is definitely gonna make a big move in the future, especially with just how everything works out um, with, uh, you know, the, the, the people involved in the activity that they have. And I think that the audience is certainly that, that up and coming audience, which will be great uh to have access to um i think i personally think facebook is kind of getting to a point where you know it's it's hard to stand out you know i think you know it's 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 essential for, for businesses to get involved in it i think it's you know it's kind of you know no different than you know print was required you know 50 years ago and i I think Facebook is, is kind of required depending upon, I mean, unless you're exclusively on Amazon, but I think, you know, uh, Facebook is certainly, Facebook and Instagram are certainly uh, a requirement for the most part. So I think staying active in, in those platforms is always going to be a good thing. Uh, how long that lasts, I, 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 I don't know. I think my guess is probably as good as anybody else's. I just can't see Facebook being, a, you know, an effective way, you know, much longer, you know, but that's, yeah, that's that I would say. What about, have you guys done any testing on, um, on YouTube, uh, you know, YouTube advertising or, you know, Snapchat advertising or anything like that? Yeah. So, uh, we do have a current ad, we do have a video, uh, that runs on our commercial that runs on YouTube and we also are doing OTT as well. Um, when it comes to Snapchat, we've explored it, but we, we haven't fully jumped into it yet. And I think that had to do with the, what we're working with right now. I think Snapchat doesn't fully fit in with how, how with what our plan is. I think mm -hmm. Snapchat's certainly viable. Um, Reddit is obviously an option. You know, it's certainly an option. We, we explored it. Um, actually, a pretty, pretty funny story with that. So um, our uh, cold brew, our nitro brew that we released in 2017, the end of 2017, um, we ended up having to do a recall on it. Um, and not because of any, any bad thing, but essentially like once it got released, um, the FDA did a, a test on it and they found out that like potentially one thing could mean one thing and you might get botulism kind of thing is how that, that all worked out. <laughs> right. And so it was like, and we tested the whole thing through and everything was fine, but like this one study came out. And so naturally we recalled it way, you know, before anybody got sick. And so, uh, uh the subreddit, not the onion, uh, picked up on that. And, you know, it, it immediately, you know, when I got to the front page of Reddit and, uh, we, uh, we stay involved in the communication with that. And it was, it was a lot of fun, you know, like I think, you know, a us, you know, kind of saving face and pulling out the humility of it and just going through the conversations that we have with, um, you know, the, the different people and their, and their opinion on it. But, um, so we just launched our regular cold brew, um, our black and slightly sweetened cold brew uh, about a month ago in July. And, uh, so I was like, 
hey, let's take that opportunity uh, because of the, the top comment in that um, in that that subreddit or that yeah that subreddit was um, death wish comma granted, and so like that that made it, and I was like that's pretty funny. Let's run an ad because again, Reddit is so volatile. Like I think Reddit is a perfect example of what I think Gen Z is going to be like. Only like they're just super vocal. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just a totally <laughs> right. different economy. It's so, like they'll call yeah. you out right away. And so yep. I was like, well, you know, like, you know, let's, let's just take the sting out of, of, yeah, of the recall from, from the nitro and run an ad on Reddit and just use that comment specifically and just say death wish granted again, and then just link it back to our cold brew page and just kind of, you know, see what happens that way, you know, and then we had some strategy inside of that as well. You know, we, we, uh, I think about a day after we had it running, we linked to the original, um, to the original subreddit and, um, someone actually saw that and then tagged the original user uh, or the, the user of that comment. And then it ended up getting a pretty decent amount of traction, um, which resulted in a pretty fair amount of sales for us. And it allowed us to kind of get a little bit of exposure in Reddit. Um, I think so with Reddit, I think, you know, I, I have heard a lot of people say like, oh, Reddit's definitely a place to go to. And, and as a, you know, long time user of Reddit and a lover of Reddit, I think, I think that there's some opportunity there, but I think you have to be really specific. You have to be really transparent about what you're doing. Yeah. I think, you know, I, you're not going to get the returns that you're going to get on, on social, you know, on, on Facebook or, or Instagram, for instance. But I think that that doesn't mean that you can't um, see a lot of success by using Reddit. I just think you have to certainly be creative and um, you have to, you have to know what you're getting yourself into for sure. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think Reddit, Reddit's one of those sort of, it's kind of a guerrilla marketing territory where it's, there's a ton of opportunity in there, but it's not clear or clean cut for, for everybody. And there's not a, there's not a playbook for it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think it's gonna be interesting to see and watch how, how brands start to take more advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think I, I like I said, like I, I enjoy Reddit and I love seeing the ads that are in there and you know, it's like, there's a lot of you know, use of memes, but like, you know, very Reddit-esque memes, you know, things like kind of mm-hmm. generator from there. So it's, it's, it's really interesting just to kind of see what people have to say. And I think, you know, Reddit's very timely with things too. I mean, if you, if your timing isn't right on things, you know, with, because of a social event, I mean, you never know what your ad might be next to, you know, on, on top of news or something like that. So, which is, you know, it can be unfortunate, but it could also play out to, to your benefit. So I think um, the guerrilla marketing is very true. I mean, we certainly took that approach with, uh, with how, with the ad that we just ran with it. And so, and I think this, I think what you did is basically just answer my next question, which was going to be, you know, what's, what do you see kind of in the future that you want to start testing, you know, stuff that if you kind of had your way and your wishes to, to go out on your own, what would you want to start testing, you know, uh, uh, whether it be new channels, whether it be new tactics, whether it be new content, what do you see as sort of the fun stuff to start new testing down the road to, to scale a brand uh, in this day and age? Oh, yeah, I, I really think, um, OOH would be great, you know, especially with video recognition. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't really know too many companies. I think I want to say, I think Chevy or GMC might've, might've ran an ad, um, you know, that had a, an, uh, FR, a facial recognition camera on a, a digital display. I think it was somewhere, I think it might've been at like T-Mobile arena. And so they, they came up with, you know, three, essentially three commercials that would then be responsive based upon the person that came in front of it. Um, it was super specific though. I mean, I don't think it got, it went too far beyond that, but you know, I mean, we've had a lot of really cool concepts that we've, you know, like sketched out, you know, here, but it's just, you know, kind of trying to tackle that would be, would be pretty difficult, but I think, Oh, it's going to be a big one. I mean, you know, with traditional media kind of, you know, not kind of like certainly, you know, kind of falling to the wayside of, you know, digital and even TV for that matter. I think, you know, billboards, for instance, you know, are, are, you know, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow in the sense of cost for, for what that, you know, translates to, or what, you know, what the um, attribution window, like, you know, we don't really know what that's effective for, but I think when it comes to digital OH, especially with, you know, getting really creative with, um, you know, ads that are, you know, display and interact with the people that are, um, in front of it, I think is going to be huge, especially when you look as the millennial generation is all about experience. So if you can have an ad, especially, you know, in a big, big public venue, you know, and again, this is like something I would love to do is again, just have this opportunity to do it at, you know, at T-Mobile arena in Vegas or at Madison square garden, where you just got an ad where people, somebody walks by and then all of a sudden our ad, you know, is able to understand that the majority of the people walking by are female. And therefore we can start to kind of, you know, create this ad that is responsive to that group of people and just kind of make this funny experience with them. I think, you know, that to me is, but to me, I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunity there and facial recognition software and cameras are, I mean, they're, they're pretty inexpensive. So I, to me, that would be, that'd be super cool. But I think that's, that seems like such a, a space age thing at this point. 
It does, but it's 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 being developed quickly, and and as we've seen, yes. this stuff comes this stuff comes fast. So I think yes. that's I think it's an interesting interesting concept and perspective. And again, it goes directly to what you guys do, which is again try to tailor you know your core messaging in a way that connects with that specific audience on a very granular level, and that mm-hmm. would be right in line with it sounds like what you guys are already doing at a larger scale with with some of your other efforts. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. It's just you know trying to keep the messaging specific specific, but, you know, very aligned with our brand. You know, we're not going to tell a group of people one thing and then tell a different group of people a different thing. I mean, I don't think anybody in their right mind would do that. Um, you know, not, not knowingly at least, but, you know, obviously, um, there's, there's nothing wrong certainly by, you know, creating an advertisement that is specific to a specific audience. And I think, you know, if that requires, um, you know, either a different creative, a different tone, a different word, then, then, then that's acceptable. And I don't think that there's anything, you know, misleading about that. And it just provides, you know, us uh, the opportunity to be more creative and to speak to people who, um, you know, maybe we don't currently have the opportunity to speak to because, you know, we're just like, these are the rules that we have to follow. And these are the words that we have to say. And, you know, I think if you stick it to that, that, that lane, then, I mean, you're, you're at, you're begging to put yourself out of business. Yep. I would, I would agree. I would absolutely agree. Yeah. Well, this was, this was great, man. I, and I'm, I'm sort of, sort of step us towards wrapping up here. Um, what's the best place for, for folks to, you know, to, to learn more about you and what you do? Are you active on, on Twitter or Instagram or any place you'd want to direct people towards? I wish I was more active on Twitter. I really do. Um, and my Instagram, it's, I've, I, honestly, my passion of, of work is just it's so much. Like I don't ever do anything on social media. Uh, yep. But LinkedIn probably would be the best place to find me. It's typically where I where I try to stay somewhat active. Um, cool. But yeah, it's just LinkedIn. Uh, Will Critcher, uh, I think that's what it is. There, that's yeah, like I, I say I work in digital marketing. I'm like I think it's what it is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. Um, you know, we uh, I'm actually speaking at a, a Clavio Boston conference coming up here. Uh, the end of this month, which would be a lot of fun. Be awesome. A great That's event. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that'll be a lot of fun. I hope to meet just a lot of like-minded people and rub elbows and get some ideas and give some ideas. So it'll be a, that'll be a really good time. But yeah, I think uh, LinkedIn would definitely be the best way to, to find me. And then obviously we do a, um, a weekly podcast that we also air on Facebook live and Twitch. Um, and so sometimes I hop on that too. So that was a good place to get some insight and information as the company and, and the people that work here. And what's the, uh, the name of that podcast? Uh, so fueled by death. Fueled by death. Fueled by death. Yep. Fueled by death. Uh, cast. I think is actually what it's called. Okay. Awesome. I'll have to check that out, and we'll link to all this stuff in in the show notes for everybody listening. Um, all right. Well, this is awesome, man. Thanks for being on. Um, I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up here because we went up. Uh, pretty in depth on a lot of this, but there's, you know, I, I think you triggered a bunch of side conversations and things that I'd like to go deeper on in the future. So I think we'll have to bring you back and, and go uh, a little more in depth on some of these topics. Um, and then if anybody who's heading to Clavio's uh, event in Boston, be sure to check out and meet well. Uh, he'll be there speaking. Are you on a panel? Or are you giving a talk? Yeah, I've got, I'm speaking. I think it's on Saturday or Saturday. My day's totally wrong. It's on the first day. It's on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. I think I'm one of the, one of the first people. Okay. Awesome. Well, make sure you guys check out Will. So, Will, thanks for thanks for being on the show, man. We'll have to have you back. I appreciate the opportunity, man. It was a great chat. Thanks for bearing with me there. I can definitely go off the rails. No, no. I thought it was great. That's, that's exactly <laughs> what we wanted to do. Awesome. Thanks, man. Awesome. Hey, crew. It's Alan Bird again. And real quick before you go, would you like a weekly digest of what's working today in the world of consumer-facing e-commerce? Every week, our team of strategists compile a single email with growth strategies and operations tactics to help you stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the competition. Think of it as the brand operator's cheat sheet. Just head over to thecommercelab.com to sign up.